We need to talk about the rule of law. A podcast by Verfassungsblock and Deutscher Anwaltsverein. We need to talk about constitutional courts. We have seen it in Hungary, we have seen it in Poland, we have seen it in Russia and Turkey, and we may well be seeing it right now in the US. Authoritarian populist regimes go to enormous lengths to pack their respective supreme or constitutional courts with loyalists, and they do that for a reason. A court which has the power to declare their laws and acts unconstitutional and null and void obviously can be a tremendous pain in the neck of a would-be autocrat. A court which follows the will of the government, however, can be tremendously useful when it comes to fending off judgments of European or international courts, for example, as we've also seen in Hungary. We need to talk about constitutional courts, and we do so with three eminent guests, two of whom former constitutional judges with first-hand experience on these matters, and one, a scholar who has written an outstanding book on the constitutional court that is, or at least has until recently been, probably the most influential in Europe, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht in Karlsruhe. I'm talking to Stanislaw Biernat, professor of constitutional law at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and until 2017, vice president of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. I am talking to Pedro Cruz Villalon, professor at the Universidad Autónoma in Madrid, and most recently known to many listeners as a former advocate general at the European Court of Justice. And before that, he was a judge and then the president of the Spanish Constitutional Court. And finally, last but not least, I am talking to Michaela Heilbronner, who is a professor at the University of Gießen and has previously worked with Bruce Ackerman at Yale Law School on the Bundesverfassungsgericht from a comparative constitutionalist perspective. Now, Professor Biernat, you were there when it happened. You were vice president of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal when the PiS-led government launched their takeover campaign against the court, a takeover which, one must say, has been ultimately successful, with the court in its current setup a reliable ally of the government in even their most egregious acts against the rule of law. The struggle against the court went over a long time, though, and it wasn't entirely obvious at the outset that the court would lose it in the end. Did this occur gradually, step by step, or was there a decisive moment in this process when things went sideways? Yeah, so the crisis started in 2015 after the, the election, parliamentary and presidential election. And at the very beginning, the first step was just the destruction of the constitutional court. It happened that the, the new uh, law was passed, and then in next month, six uh, subsequent laws concerning the constitutional court, and all of them had the same aim, the same goal, to destroy the, the tribunal as an independent body, which uh, was able to control the laws and, and other acts of of parliament and of administration. And several uh, moments where I step by step realized that as a matter of fact, uh, it was the, the, the main idea to have no one which is able to stop the new power, the new authorities uh, to pass law without any control. And some of them, some of these moments where, for instance, the refusal uh, of taking the oath by the president uh, for uh, five uh, new judges and the installment of the judges which were not uh, legitimate to, to take this position. And then uh, next moment was the refusal of application uh, of judgments of, of the constitutional court. And at the end, it was the installment of a new president of the court after the, the end of, of uh, the term of, of the previous president, and it was done against the constitution and, and against the laws. Okay, but what was the moment of no return? What was the moment when, when it was clear that the court was doomed? It all lasted about 15 months. 
And the 2016 was a very peculiar year because the Constitutional Court functioned in the old uh, composition with three uh, new judges which were not recognized by the president of the court as a judges. And the judgments of the Constitutional Court were not uh, published by the, uh, uh, the prime minister, which had a technical competence to publish the rulings of the Constitutional Court, but it used this technical power to refuse uh, publication. And then uh, in December 2016, the new president was installed against the Constitution, but cannot be reviewed, controlled by the tribunal, because there was no the, the real tribunal already at that time. Um, Professor Cruz, many observers of the plight of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal and the Hungarian Constitutional Court before it used to be complacent, saying, oh, this is an Eastern European thing, a lingering problem of post-communist trouble with overcoming old authoritarian structures and so forth, and therefore basically none of our Western European concern. Now, your country, Spain, as much as Germany for that matter, has an authoritarian past as well, and its constitutional court had an important role to play in the transition. Before that backdrop, how do you see what has happened in Poland? Would it be completely inconceivable, legally or politically, that the Spanish constitutional court under certain circumstances might suffer a similar fate one day? Okay, a present danger, uh, there is not a present danger. Uh, that the legislative or even the, amend the amendment power engage in an operation aimed at the political control of the Spanish constitutional court. And the answer is a clear no. Yeah? There have been different changes in the organic law and the constitutional court in the past, but none of them has luckily had the character of a direct attack on the independence of the court, no? Okay. Okay, nevertheless, eh, in the present situation, the court may be considered the situation as critical. Eh? But eh, interestingly enough, not because of an action, but because of an omission. The Spanish Parliament, its lower house, in this occasion, has submitted to propose to the king four names for the partial renewal of the court due since the last year. Eh? The two main parties have failed in reaching an agreement on these new judges. This is unfortunately not a novelty. What is a sad novelty is the fact that a couple of weeks ago, the main opposition party blatantly declared that it would not engage in talks with the main party of the present coalition government until this party breaks its coalition with its other partner in government. This is an, an appalling novelty, something completely unheard of, and I sincerely hope that this political party speedily changes this scandalous attitude. Michaela Heilbronner, the German Constitutional Court has for decades and still does enjoy an amount of trust and even veneration among the German public, which is unparalleled in Europe and most of the world. But also the Bundesverfassungsgericht and, and its relations to the government has seen rockier times in the past. To which extent do you think Karlsruhe can feel safe? I think the German constitutional court is um, still in a very secure position. It Constitutional review has been sort of a, an established, entrenched part of the German understanding of what democracy and um, the rule of law imply. And so it is very hard for political parties to attack the court in any manner that really goes to the institutional sort of basic points at, at the moment. We Occasionally the court makes an unpopular judgment and then we see... Um, some backlash from some parts of the uh, from from some political actors, but that kind of criticism has not harmed the court in a major way. So, for example, in the 90s, we have these famous decisions: soldiers are murderers, um, and the crucifix decisions with the court um, weighing in on the question of crucifixes and Bavarian classrooms. And both of these decisions were enormously unpopular. Though, at the time, and the court got lots of um, what we would call today hate mail, perhaps. And it damaged its reputation, but it recovered after a while. And presumably, part of the reason for that is that 
actors in the political system had meanwhile accepted constitutional review as sort of an important part of how German democracy works. Right. The Polish um, Constitutional Court has, has never enjoyed the same level of public support uh, all throughout the, the political spectrum. Um, and that was named as one of the reasons why it was more vulnerable um, at the time. Uh, do you think, Professor Bjernat, um, that um, in retrospect, um, the Polish Constitutional Court should have built more, or, or maybe general uh, Eastern European Constitutional Courts should have um, um, made a greater effort to build consensus in, throughout the political spectrum? Or would that be uh, a wrong way of looking at this thing? So the, the Polish Constitutional Court is a relatively new institution. Uh, therefore, it was not enough time to just to, to convince the society that there is something like that and that uh, the Constitutional Court is important for, let's say, normal people, people on, on the street. Uh, many, many people uh, were not able to distinguish between the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court. And they didn't uh, see the impact of the judgments of the court uh, on, on their uh, everyday life, although there were many judgments which were really important for the individual people uh, and, and many social groups. But uh, after the election uh, 2015, it was relatively easy to attack the Constitutional Court and uh, to uh, to show the to, to present the Constitutional Court as an enemy, which will which would uh, destroy the social changes uh, and, and, and social benefits which were planned and which were introduced. It was a lie, of course, but the society was not interested in details, uh, and therefore this uh, authority which uh, the Constitutional Court had still in, in the society was not deep enough just to, let's say, to be able to stop or just to, uh, to, to, to be a real problem for, for the new authorities. So it was not very bad as far as the authority of the, the Constitutional Court is concerned, but it was not to compare with the the authority of of Bundesverfassungsgericht of uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, because it was the, the the factor of time, and factor of experience and of tradition. Was it a failure on the part of the Con Polish Constitutional Tribunal that its decision somehow failed to elicit the trust of the public in a way that uh, the the German Constitutional Court did? No, no, no. The, the problem is that the the new authorities were not against a, a special line of uh, jurisdiction on the approach uh, of the Polish Constitutional Court to certain um, uh, legal or constitutional matters. It was against the Constitutional Court as an institution because it didn't want to have an independent institution which is able to stop the, un the unconstitutional laws. It was the problem. It was a the, the 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 constitutional court was an obstacle in the way of uh, making a new new systemic changes without changing the, the 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 constitution itself. All right. So it was not about being against the institution because it got into the way of certain policies, but being against the institution full stop. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to show that, that uh, for instance, now the, the most sensitive cases were brought to the Constitutional Tribunal by the, the ruling party uh, MPs or by uh, state uh, authorities, like the Marshal of the same of the Prime Minister, not by the opposition. And the reason is just to uh, legitimize the unconstitutional laws, just to that the, the the political choices are constitutional. So it's, it's the just opposite, the very idea of the constitutional court. Right. If we um, turn to Spain for a minute, 
the Spanish constitutional court has, has itself treaded on extremely delicate ground in recent years um, with the Catalan crisis and the threat of separatism and open defiance of the constitutional order in Catalonia and so forth. Um, to the extent that you allow yourself to comment on the work of your former court, Professor Cruz, what does the Catalan drama teach us about the limits of constitutional jurisdictions in terms of pacifying a political conflict of that sort and order of magnitude? Are there some issues which ca cannot and should not be treated as constitutionally predetermined at the risk of damaging democracy? And is the integrity of the national state one of them? Well, there is some lessons, yes, uh, the, the different lessons to learn from the from this crisis, from this present, uh, I must say, this present crisis. And one of them is the the design of the of the constitution and the law of the, uh, the constitution court, for instance, uh, that you should not have a review of constitutionality of a status of autonomy after a plebiscite, after a referendum. Referendum and constitutional adjudication are not so good friends. And that uh, and, and you, should, you shouldn't do that. Uh, another problem is if you want to, to change the status of Catalonia in a way that requires an amendment of the constitution, you must amend the constitution and afterwards change the statute of autonomy. If you skip the change of the constitution the, and then you ask for the opinion of the court, the court has no other uh, way as to declare unconstitutional some uh, points of this new statute. And so this is not the fault of the Constitutional Court. It is the fault, so to say, of the political system. That's another question. And even another lesson, the political question must be solved politically. In December, no, well, no in the autumn of nine, 2017, we had blatantly unconstitutional laws Uh, passed by the Catalan Parliament, you could either simply satisfy yourself with the nullifying, immediate nullifying of the law of Parliament by the by the Constitutional Court, or use uh, the instrument that was uh, at the end used the what in Germany is called the Bundesfang, the state coercion or federal coercion. So uh, if you proceed in that way, I mean, the, this uh, federal coercion arrives too late. And that's, I think, another lesson for the government, uh, that there is a limit in certain conflicts to use the, the constitutional adjudication in a moment when the a nullification uh, is ignored by the given territory. This is a little bit strong to say, but it's a, it's a crude truth. In, in the US right now, there's a political storm of epic proportion brewing about the successor of, of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the legendary Supreme Court justice, which has uh, deceased. Um, uh, or more precisely, if the incumbent president, Trump, gets to nominate this successor, um, even though his party denied this very right to President Obama when th with the supposed argument that in an election year, this right should be reserved to the winner of the election, who may very well be Joe Biden now. Now, if that happens, and the, and the winner will indeed be uh, Joe Biden, Professor Bjarnard, Many Democrats argue that the time is right for a complete overhaul of the Supreme Court, right? Maybe nominating a number of additional judges, um, in other words, tampering with the setup of the court that, to change its politics. If it comes to that, would that be comparable to what peace did to your court? And what would your advice be? Uh, I still believe that the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court is much stronger than the, 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 the Polish Constitutional Court, 
and I, I don't think the the president uh, is able to um, let's say to, to to weaken it in a very um, considerable uh, way. Uh, so uh, although I I am not uh, uh, let's say uh, mildly speaking an enthusiast of President Trump. I don't believe uh, that the new nomination, even if it will be decided now, before the election, uh, will change the overall position of the Supreme Court. Okay, but isn't the problem that the damage maybe has already been, been done? Um, when the Republicans in the Senate denied President Obama's nominee even a hearing in 2016, That struck me as a full-blown attack against the constitutional conventions of a comparable kind of what went down in other countries, right? So um, isn't, isn't that a, a right-wing takeover attempt that is happening in the U.S. right now? I would say the, the, the problem is not in the personal beliefs of, uh, of the judges or, or the candidates. They, they are very good lawyers and, a, a, let's say, a, and, and their moral quality is high. Uh, and the experience in the U.S. Uh, uh, shows that in the, some judges change their attitudes to, to various matters uh, during their very long term, uh, the, the, their death or something like that. So in Poland, my, uh, my complaint is not that some judges have a very, let's say, um, specific uh, attitudes, uh, they are conservative or not, but they are uh, not independent, internally not independent. Uh, they are chosen for their, uh, let's say, now, it's, it's, it's a very uh, strong accusation, I would say, what, what, what I'm going to say. But I think that the, the new uh, judges and uh, new candidates for judges in last years were uh, chosen especially because they are weak, because they, are, uh, they, they can be, uh, let's say, easily influenced by the, the court president or by, by, by politicians. It's a problem. It's not the political beliefs, but their internal integrity. All right. Michaela Heilbonner, um, the, the German Constitutional Court owes much of its standing to the fact that its judges are not perceived as political agents or belonging to a, to, to a certain political spectrum which guides their decision-making, as opposed to the U.S. Supreme Court justices, that they don't serve the interest of those who have appointed and elected them, but the law and nothing else, right? This is also this image they like to paint of themselves, isn't it? And that has to do with the fact that the judges are elected by a two-thirds majority, which means that the government usually needs the votes of the opposition to elect the judge, which in turn means that the whole election procedure is depoliticized in the first place and uh, uh, taking place widely off the radar of the public and nobody noticed it and nobody re really knows the persons and the candidates and nobody cares much, right? Now, the thing is um, that this two-thirds majority itself is not protected in the Constitution and it could be abolished any day by a simple majority. And um, the, the more likely a party in parliament with more than a third of votes becomes, um, the more likely it will, is that this um, two-thirds majority will indeed be abolished by, by the um, political establishment already. So how, how vulnerable do you think the German Bundesverfassungsgericht really is to the danger of majoritarian politicization? So, I mean, I would say one thing first about the U.S., which is that I'm sure that U.S. judges at the Supreme Court don't perceive them entirely themselves as entirely political agents either, right? I mean, that the U.S. Supreme Court appears more politicized um, has been the result of sort of long developments in U.S. law over the last few decades. And one thing that is pointed out in the U.S. literature is that, in fact, if you look at the Supreme Court decisions, that there's a great number of decisions where the judges vote unanimously, of course, on matters. Now, that said, it is true, of course, that the German sort of two-thirds majority for selecting a judge has helped to ensure that we pick relatively moderately moderate political candidates, not political uh, candidates that are sort of perceived as radical. And as you point out rightly, that is not constitutionally entrenched. 
with regard to the question whether this is something we should potentially politically entrench, I'm actually a little bit divided. There is a good argument for that, of course, um, to say that that way we will preserve this sort of relatively depoliticized image of the court, and that image is important to the court's authority and therefore to its ability basically to do its job. On the other hand side, of course, if we entrench that and we enter times, and I think to some degree we have already entered those times where the politics in Germany gets more divisive, that also does create certain risks. For example, um, and that speaks, I think, to some of the things we've been discussing previously, for example, what happens if um, the parties can't agree on candidates to pick, and then we have a deadlock in the relevant bodies who are there to appoint judges, and then what happens, for example, if there are not enough judges on the court and so on. So there's swings and roundabouts, um, you might say, advantages and disadvantages to entrenching that. To conclude, here is a question which goes to each of you. Please name the three most important conditions for a functional constitutional court. Please, Professor Bianat. Three items. The way of uh, selecting judges. Second, independence of the in the uh, uh, constitutional courts. And three is the scope of jurisdiction and effectiveness of judgments. Uh, well, the, 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 there are the, there are various possibilities. For instance, the jurisdiction of Polish constitutional court is much uh, narrower than in Germany, because the Polish tribunal is not uh, competent to review individual acts, but only the laws and uh, uh, general acts. And as far as the effectiveness is concerned, the, the, the problem is that usually the constitutional court is not able to implement uh, and execute its judgment by itself. It needs the uh, cooperation with other authorities. And these uh, authorities are should act strictly and quickly, but it's it's not always the case. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I agree with Professor Bianet in almost everything he has said. First, uh, a clear mandate. Secondly, a clear profile, and third, a clear vision. There must be. A clear notion in society why there is a constitutional court. This is a political consideration like the others, but anyway, for me, it's a, it's a main precondition. It, it is not at all obvious that there is a constitutional court. Obvious is the Supreme Court. Constitutional court, as a matter of principle, is not obvious. So uh, the society must agree with the idea of a constitutional court to be a double apex in the judiciary. And for that, you need a clear rationale. What is the reason for this duplication? And if you give, if you give a reason, like, for instance, that A, the judiciary should not be situated above the legislative power, B, that the legislative power should not be situated above the Constitution, C, that there should be a procedure to subject the legislative power to the Constitution, and lastly, D, that this procedure should have the qualities of a court of justice, then you would have possibly arrived to the conclusion that the polity in question needs a constitutional court. But the challenge is that this conclusion, this rationale, must be accepted as a matter of principle by society. The society must feel itself like identified with its constitutional court. And that's already, for me, a main precondition. Is this precondition um, um, uh, still intact in, in Spain? Uh, well, uh, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. The, the constitutional court has been attacked from different sides and uh, the court has been... Oh, in the middle of a lot of political model, and, and uh, I'm not so sure that there is a, a firm, a steady identification 
for the Spanish society with the Constitutional Court. My second precondition is a clear profile. Eh? It, it cannot be a simple duplication of the Supreme Court. Eh? The Constitutional Court must be something different. Otherwise, you don't need a, a Constitutional Court. Eh? And, and it implies a number of things, a, a large approval by the political organs, Consequently, a democratic, even if indirect, legitimacy. People, I mean, the judges should have a large, very large approval across political fraction. They should have a long single mandate, not for life, not renewable, something like that. That would be my second. My third is a clear vision. A clear vision from the side of the members of the court themselves. That means that you, as a constitutional judge, must have a clear notion of what belongs to your mandate and what exceeds your mandate. That means in the positive that you know what constitutional interpretation is all about in general and in the given case. And that because you have this clear notion, because you have that, you must be able to convey that to others in a negative sense. And with that, I put an end to this description Clear vision means self-restriction. Precisely because there is no one above you, you must be careful not to go beyond your mandate. Huh? The Constitution is not a carte blanche in the hands of the constitutional judge. And this applies in the first place to its position vis-à-vis -vis the parliament. They are supposed not to tread in the realm of politics, but it also applies to the judiciary in the case whenever the Constitutional Court is in the position to quash judicial resolution. Eh? So, Michaela, what would, would your three points be? I think I would approach it perhaps from a more political science perspective and say the three most important things are support, the court can't have too strong enemies, and it must be sometimes able to play a strategic game. Now, If I can explain that for a moment a little bit, S support seems obvious, but nevertheless, one of the most important things for courts is that they have allies. And those allies can be part of the political system. So, for example, in Germany, the German Constitutional Court has often been heavily criticized by the German government, in particular in its early years, in the 50s and so on. But what helped the court was that the opposition in parliament, that was the social democrats at the time, were defending the court and it also helped that the court had allies within the media, for example. So that is something that is particularly important. And by the way, one of the reasons why oppositions often support constitutional courts is of course that they hope, um, or that even governments support constitutional courts, is that they know they will likely be in opposition at some point in the future And therefore, a constitutional court provides a certain mechanism to resolve political question on, and also to set certain baselines. And thus, they are sort of insuring themselves against political change in the future. This has been called insurance theory by Tom Ginsburg, one of the major people writing on constitutional courts. And, of course, um, part of that is also support from um, civil society. That can be NGOs. Um, though that can be just people who are willing to go on the street if, um, for example, governments do not implement the decisions of constitutional courts. And that ties in to some degree what, what I've said is the second condition, the court shouldn't have enemies that are too strong. So we see, for example, constitutional courts doing better in systems where political parties are relatively weak or at least not too strong. So the most dangerous thing for a constitutional court in some ways is a strong dominant um, party which has which knows that it will likely win not just the next elections, but the elections after that, and which therefore has little to lose by attacking the court. And the last one, um, the last point strategy is that in certain conditions, it's useful if courts are able to play a little bit the strategic game, if they are not overreaching and they are not inviting um, what is called backlash, that is significant re resistance to courts that can damage the court's institutional authority as well. Right. Um, okay. I guess we could go on another couple of hours. There's so many points we haven't even touched upon yet, but our time's up. Thanks a million to all three of you. It was tremendously interesting and thought-provoking, to me at least. 
and I hope to you listeners as well. Now as to our next episode, which will air next week, Wednesday, and will be about the topic, uh, which has also a lot to do with what is going on in Poland, which is judicial nominations, the way judges at ordinary courts are appointed and elected. Once again, a seemingly technical, but in fact hugely consequential matter when it comes to placing government loyalists in the rank and files of the judicial branch of government. This is what we will discuss next week, and our guests are Filippo Donati, the newly elected president of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary and a professor of constitutional law at the University of Florence. Then there is Joanna Hetnarowicz-Sikora of the Polish Judges Association Justitia, and Christiane Schmalz, a judge at the Apex Civil and Criminal Court of Germany, the Federal Court. I'm very much looking forward to this. I thank you for listening also on behalf of our co-producer, the German Bar Association Deutsche Anwaltverein. And we are urging you to participate and ask any questions about judicial appointments and the rule of law and democracy to our distinguished guests you like on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram using the hashtag law rules, law rules by speech memo, direct message or good old fashioned email. And we'll see you next week. And I hope you had fun with this episode. Bye-bye.